This massive ring made of iron and measuring 43 centimeters in diameter used to hang on the door of the parish of Forsha in the province of Helsingland in northern Sweden. It is inscribed with runes and it is the earliest example of a legal text in Scandinavia. So let's have a look and see what it can tell us about the Viking Age. The inscription is quite intriguing. If you read the first few lines, you're going to realize it has to do with some sort of payment. So, uksa tu ixilan auk aura tuo stav at forsta laki, uksa tu auk aura fiura at adru laki, in at tridia laki uksa fiura auk aura at a stav. So if you were to look at it word by word, it would be something like ox double worth an ere two star for first time, ox two and ere four for the second time, but third time ox four and ere eight staff. So what uh, does it refer to? Ever since the 19th century, it has been argued that the second word should be read differently at uis skillan, and this would change the meaning quite a lot. Uh, it would refer to the restoration of a sanctuary. So if you look in the runic database, you would find the following translation. One ox and two ounces of silver in fine to the staff for the restoration of a sanctuary in valid state for the first time. Two oxen and four ounces of silver in fine for the second time. But for the third time, four oxen and eight ounces of silver in fine and all property in suspension if he doesn't make it right. That the people are entitled to demand according to the law of the people that was decreed and ratified before. But they made themselves this ring, Anon from Torsta and Ufek from Hjotsta. But Vibion painted. That the people are entitled to demand according to the law of the people that was decreed and ratified before, but they made the pronouncement Anand from Torsta and Ofe from Jotsta, but Vibion painted. So there is a slight repetition here. It is very interesting that a law rule relating to a V, which is an old term for a sanctuary, for a pagan place, should be inscribed on, on a ring. However, if you look at the more general context, it actually does start to make sense because we have a number of documentary references to sacred rings, particularly in the context of swearing an oath. For example, when King Alfred makes peace with the great Viking army at Wareham, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle states for the year 876 that the king made peace with the raiding army and then they swore oaths on the sacred ring, which earlier they would not do so with anyone else that they um, should quickly go from his kingdom. If you read some of the poems in the Poetic Edda, you're going to find one poem called the Atlakvida with a very precise reference, which is swearing on the ring of Ullr. Now, Ullr is quite a mysterious god in Norse mythology, but it does seem uh, like he had some sort of legal component uh, to him at any rate. And the context is particularly interesting if uh, you also look at the archaeological documentation, because there was an excavation in the year 2007 at a site called Lila Ulevi, which literally means the sacred site or the sacred grove of Ullur. And um, here it was revealed that it was indeed a cultic site dating back to the Vendel area, so that would have been uh, pre-Viking, and they found no fewer than 65 amulet rings. There is also mention of rings in temples later in sources such as the Book of Settlements, the Londoma book about the uh, settlement of Iceland, as well as in some later sagas. So there might have been some sort of memory related to um, these sacred rings and their usage, both in a religious and a legal context. So coming back to the translation from the runic database, it might not be accurate because the term ounce is different than ere. Ere would have been something like um, nine Islamic dirhams, um, roughly 20 grams of silver, so quite a considerable fine. The dominant interpretation states that the fine was settled by providing an ox and to Ure. The dating of the ring has also sparked off quite a debate. Initially, it was considered that it dated back to the 12th century, so to Christian times, and there has also been speculation that the uh, legal worth of an ox would have been to Ure, but in that time, the price would have uh, increased. Double worth ox, if we preserve the old translation, would have been um, twice as valuable as a regular ox, so it would have required more uh, Ure. 
Eventually, the ring was placed in the Viking Age in the 10th century by reinterpreting one of the runes and changing the word for priesthood to the word for people, uh, Luthir, the people instead of Lirthir, the learned, and also comparing the style of the runes to other sources such as the Rök runestone. So a recent interpretation challenges the economic assumption so far and reevaluates the Fosha ring in its monetary and legal context. The main point is that the inscription seems to require both forms of payment. But in fact, it is more plausible that um, a value equivalence of oxen and silver would have taken place. Because if you think of it from a practical point of view, the transaction makes little sense for, let's say, someone who has a lot of silver but no oxen. Are they supposed to, to get these oxen? Cannot they just pay in silver? This raises a couple of interesting questions regarding medieval economics in general. The system in the Middle Ages can be described as parallel standard, where silver and various commodities were fixed in value relative to each other to allow flexibility in payments of fines. They both served as units of account, not solely as means of payment. And over time, this system evolved into bimetallism because non-metallic goods ceased to function as units of account. In the Viking Age, a fixed value relation between oxen and silver was rigidly maintained because deviating from it would have incurred high transaction costs, making alternative valuations very impractical. While monetarization is typically linked to the introduction of coinage, the Viking Age economy likely operated on a little more complex level than we would have expected. We have evidence from the period between roughly 880 and 990, such as the use of dirham coins without weighing them, that suggests that these coins function not only as currency, but also as units of account. And this would indicate a monetary system independent, more or less, of formal state-issued coins. Much like early modern bimetallism, the Viking economy would have used parallel commodity standards, such as silver and livestock, that allowed flexible payment options and fulfilled all major monetary functions. The pre-coinage system endured because it minimized transaction costs and enhanced economic efficiency. Moreover, medieval legal documents often mention that a payment could be fulfilled using one type of currency. For example, Helsingelagen, which governs the region where the Fosha ring was found, sets the Wergild at seven marks of silver or the equivalent value. So the Wergild would have been the money you paid uh, to the family of somebody murdered to avoid blood revenge. Seven marks of silver, depending on the context and period, would have meant um, something like between two and four kilograms of silver, which is an immense uh, quantity of, uh, of silver. Predominantly, Swedish medieval legislation expresses fines in monetary terms, albeit with the implicit understanding that payment can also be made in commodities of some sort, recognized valid forms of payment at any rate. But this is something to be noticed in Scandinavia in, uh, in general. So you can find it in other kinds of uh, laws, in the Gulating uh, law and, uh, uh, and other examples. So let me show you one. Now one should pay where guild and fines with grain, oxen and cows that bear calves. One can pay fines with gold, melted silver if one has it. One can pay with horses, but not with mares, with dapple grey horses, but not with geldings, and with any horse that's neither skittish nor dim-eyed, and that does not have a white foreskin or fails to urinate properly, and it has no other faults. One can pay with sheep, but not with goats. Such an example illustrates the flexibility of payment under the combined precious metal and non-metallic standard. It also demonstrates a discrepancy between the interpretation of the Fusha ring that necessitates payment in the exact amounts of two distinct goods and the established practices within the later Scandinavian legal system. When a payment required the combination of two different units, it was typically due to one unit acting as a fraction of the other. For example, in Norway in the 11th century, individuals intending to relocate to Iceland were required to remit a payment in either six cloaks and six L's of homespun fabric or half a mark of silver. However, in this case, it is possible to think of the L of homespun as a fractional component of the cloak. 
The silver öre thus likely did not function as a subunit of an ox in the same way. The two represented distinct categories of means of payment, cattle as opposed to silver. Had the öre been intended to act as a fractional value of an ox, we would anticipate its elimination through the doubling, which is evident in the Fosher ring. Another crucial aspect of this inscription is the little word that could change everything, which is auk. It's usually interpreted as and. If auk is taken to mean and in the modern additive sense, it implies that the fine must be paid in, uh, in both oxen and uh, of silver. But an alternative is very plausible. Auk may, might have originally functioned more like also or even or, especially in the context of oral societies, where meaning was conveyed not only through words themselves, but also through social context and cues. So what does this mean? Well, in oral cultures, linguistic precision was often embedded in the context rather than in syntax. Because of this, small words like auk, so and, might have served multiple purposes, connectors, adverbs, or signals of equivalence without causing too much confusion to uh, the ones actually using the words because the clarification was immediate. In contrast, written cultures require a more explicit distinction, such as the one between and and or, because the social cues are absent, so the text itself must stand alone. As a matter of fact, in Old Norse, the term ella or eða, meaning or, actually does not appear on runestones. Auk, on the other hand, was widespread and might have carried a context-sensitive meaning closer to also or as some, something more flexible rather than a strict mathematical addition. And we do have numerous examples from Swedish and Norwegian legal texts, also showing that a single fine, although written as something like an ox and a mare, or grain and ox and cows was actually meant to be paid in any one of the listed items. So in this case, clearly indicating that and likely functioned more like or in these contexts. So this is really a fascinating phenomenon. If you look at it grammatically, auk might have derived from the Proto-Germanic auka, meaning addition or increase. And you can see this later on in the Swedish word for uh, to increase, auka, as well as the conjunction for and, which is ok. So over time, language becomes more abstract. Words like auk undergo grammaticalization, which means a process um, where originally meaningful words are bleached of specific content and just turned into very specific grammatical tools. However, in earlier phases, such terms likely retained a shifting role within speech, and this um, subtle linguistic difference carries implication, large implication for how we understand Viking Age legal and economic systems, because they're not really underdeveloped. Um, they're actually contextually sophisticated and orally fluent, just not always clearly tra translatable into um, modern written expectations. So if you take any kind of um, Scandinavian legal text and have a look at these equivalences, you're going to find formulas such as one should pay well guild and fines with grain, oxen and cows that bear calves, but no one actually expected you to pay with all of these things. So in the context of the Fosha ring, although the inscription refers to fines involving both oxen and öre, it is unlikely, very unlikely, that both were required as physical payments. Instead, the two items likely functioned as interchangeable units of account with a fixed value relation between them, specifically one ox uh, equaling two öre of silver, at least in this region of Sweden. And this aligns with what is known as multi-commodity or commodity money system where different goods such as oxen and silver are used side by side as standardized value measures. Though only one of these commodities might be paid physically in a given transaction, both were present in legal and financial calculations. So you can think of it like this. You wouldn't say someone paid two dollars or two euros and two hundred cents uh, because two hundred cents is two dollars or two euros. So you can describe the payment in either unit or both for clarity, but not as a, as a separate additive item. Likewise, the Fosha rings phrasing when interpreted an ox also to Öre doesn't imply a combined payment, uh, but rather than an ox might be equivalent to to Öre. The term also thus logically captures this equivalent better than and or or. 
This also leads to a linguistic reflection on the term Tuiskilan. This was the one found in an older translation uh, interpreted as double value ox. Um, some scholars have proposed that this refers to a particularly valuable ox, but uh, the more likely interpretation, if you keep this translation, is that the phrase was emphasizing the standard uh, ox valued at two Erde, ensuring that no undervalued cattle would be uh, substituted. It was a kind of institutionalized uh, repetition uh, of the same value in different forms that you can also find in Anglo-Saxon and Swedish laws. In a broader context, this practice was not unique to Scandinavia, by far unique. We actually have a lot of examples from different regions of Europe. For example, in uh, 10th century northern Iberia, we have units such as Baca Soldare, which was the standard cow, and Bos Solidare, the standard ox, used similarly with oxen serving as standard value references, even when their actual market price exceeded the unit, which would have been between 4 and 10 solidi in silver. So this shows a persistence of livestock-based units of account even after monetary systems evolved. With such arguments, we can reframe the Fofscher Ring's mention of Oxen and Erde not as literal shopping lists, but as a statement of abstract value reflecting a more sophisticated understanding of equivalency in a dual standard monetary environment. This interpretation not only aligns with linguistic and legal patterns across medieval Europe, but also emphasizes that early Scandinavian societies possessed the cognitive tools to manage complex financial concepts, even in the absence of a formal coinage system. So the ring not only is the oldest legal text retrieved so far, but reveals quite a bit about economic thinking in the Viking Age. Well, having said that, I hope you enjoyed this new insight into this fascinating artifact of the Middle Ages. If you did, make sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you're interested in the Norse, there is plenty of material on this uh, channel to satisfy your curiosity. For example, you can continue with this video right here about hair and combs. Thank you so much for watching. This was Irina. Until next time.